My name is June Andrews. I'm 84. This is the story of my trip to hospital. It started one Friday evening when I had a fall in the bathroom. My husband called the out-of-hours doctor, who told us to call 999. Arthur couldn't help me get back up on my feet. I had a nasty bruise over my right hip. I wasn't keen on coming into hospital, but they persuaded me. I was on call when Mrs Andrews was brought in, and I arranged a hip X-ray. There was no fracture, but some blood and urine tests showed that she was a little dehydrated and had a possible water infection. Mrs Andrews was moved on to the acute medical unit. She was getting close to breaching the four-hour target. It was also getting late and the AMU was a safer place to assess her and get her back on her feet. We put up a drip and gave her some antibiotic tablets for the urine infection. On Saturday morning, she was seen by the on-call medical consultant. Before we could look at her mobility, the patient flow team insisted we move her to the first available medical bed. She was not reviewed again medically till Monday. There is no routine physiotherapy or occupational therapy over weekends, so we couldn't refer her to the home rehabilitation team before then. By Monday, June had been on either a trolley or in a bed with the cot sides up for three nights because she was deemed to be at high risk of falls and the nurses had inserted a urinary catheter. She was seen that Monday morning by the physiotherapist who got her out of bed with the aid of a Zimmer frame. My home ward is in the elderly care unit. We do our best to provide a regular liaison service to other wards, although we wish the doctors there had more knowledge about managing older patients. The ward doctors and occupational therapists made a plan to get some more information about June's usual abilities and past medical history. I'm June's husband. On Monday, I was able to get back into the hospital to see her on the ward. I told the ward doctors and nurses that June had been getting more unsteady recently, had suffered another fall, and that her memory isn't what it used to be. The review team discovered that her blood pressure was dropping very low when she stood up, postural hypertension. It often leads to falls and faints in older people. We stopped a couple of her cardiac medications to try and solve this problem. By Wednesday, she was able to stand with assistance. The physios came to see her and a plan was made to refer her for ongoing rehabilitation in the local community hospital before going home. But not for the first time. There were no community beds, and by the 10th day of June's admission, the cardiology ward desperately needed beds for acute cardiac patients, and she was moved to a winter escalation ward. After all those moves, Mrs Andrews had become confused and agitated. She had another fall, sprained her wrist, and now she required two nurses to transfer her from bed. June spent increasing time in bed with the cot sides up. By day 12 of her admission, the community hospital phoned back saying that she had no rehab potential and should have a care package instead. She was referred to social services with a target discharge date for Friday, but the package couldn't be put in place till the following Tuesday. She went home with a three times a day care package, but with no clear diagnosis for her progressive memory impairment and falls. Seven weeks after her discharge from hospital, June had fallen twice more. Her memory was worsening and Arthur was becoming stressed, concerned and exhausted. June ended up being admitted for respite to a local care home. Mrs Andrews never got back to her own home after her respite. We should have more care and support for older people like her outside hospital and those services need to respond much earlier to people's needs. But the way we treated her in hospital and our difficulty getting her back on her feet and home again didn't help. With so many frail older people coming into hospital, we have to get this stuff right for everyone.